Kestur has said, future is uncertain. And he just need to be reliable, or he should make uh, choices that preserves the flexibility. So we have the next speaker, Aaron, um, who is really look far into the future and then see how much it's going to cost to store a zettabyte of data. Aaron? Thanks. They gave me a mic, they're going to regret it. <laughs> I have some props. OK, so who am I? Uh, my name is Aaron Ogis. I'm a development manager in Windows Azure Storage. I work on the lowest layer of our software stack. So my team deals with putting the data on the bits for all the media types that we have. Um, and because of that, I got involved with the uh, cost of the system. Um, this is a brief agenda of what we're going to go through today. And uh, contrary to what Kastasha said, uh, Moore's Law is not out of steam yet. Uh, there is debate over which media has which more iterations and uh, you know, where we're, we'll wind up. I think looking five years into the future is not too hard. Uh, looking farther, of course, is harder. Um, there's some things I can't talk about. So I've been doing hardware for seven years. I've sat in endless hours and hours of meetings with uh, hardware manufacturers, device manufacturers, uh, server manufacturers, um, and a lot of that information is confidential. I also can't talk about how Microsoft actually stores data in Azure, but I can show you um, different systems and different parameters for tuning those systems. And I've run some numbers with the theoretical systems on different media, and there's some results at the back here. Um, so this is briefly kind of where we started in Azure, and I'm going to talk briefly why, why we started here. Um, and I'll tell you that from when I started to now, the whole team and the hardware manufacturers and everybody have helped to reduce the cost of storage by 98%. And that is something to think about. If you can reduce the cost of something by 98% over eight years, how do people think about that today? And are they planning for eight years from now correctly? Um, and it's obvious going through this process that that was not what was going on. People tend to think very linearly and think very short term. And by thinking out five years, you're going to be able to think, you know, get your crystal ball into the future and predict the applications that will be enabled um, and then take it to the next step. If that application exists, what else can I do with that data set? So here's the question. How do we wind up um, with this system? We'll get to that in a minute. But let's talk about why we want cloud storage. So when Azure started, it wasn't clear to anybody that you could take all the data that people had and just put it in the cloud. It's like, well, that's really expensive. Um, when we started, Amazon was charging 14 cents per gigabyte per month to store data. And it's like, well, that's way too expensive. We can't do that. Um, you know, Microsoft isn't about selling storage. We sell software. If we're adding storage, we can give it away for free. You can bankrupt the company, that type of data rate, uh, data cost. Um, but it's pretty clear the advantages of cloud storage. Um, I've lost about four or five phones and all the data on them. I've lost uh, my home computer and all the data on it. And I keep hearing people, oh, I've got this backup device. I don't need the cloud. The cloud's too expensive. If you want to keep your data, it has to be in the cloud. You, houses burn down, hard drives fail, uh, computers fail. And I don't think there's anybody in this room who thinks that having all their data in the cloud is a problem. Does anybody think that is? Great. Um, oh, we've got one. So then the big question is, can we make it secure? And uh, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> so uh, I'll also tell you that when we started in 2008, I was doing the math to look a few years ahead. And I said, yeah, we can store it all in the cloud, but no one would believe me. Um, by 2011, we deployed enough storage that I got, I got invited to these leadership meetings. And I talked to everybody. And I tried to socialize, yes, we can put it all in the cloud. And I, I don't know if you're all aware, but in Office 365, we now let everybody store all their data in the cloud for free, uh, meaning that if you buy Office 365, we don't charge you for your data. OK, so here's a trick question. Um, Which server is better at storing your data on hard drives cheaper, the four drive server on the right or the 90 drive server on the left? Both of these are not Azure servers. OK, everyone who thinks it's the 90 drive server on the right, raise your hand. 
Okay, okay, they're being careful. Okay, how about the four drive server? Okay, the audience is uh, divided. Okay, so I'm in the server, the 90 drive server camp, but it's not always true. Um, so for years and years, Search and Google um, have asserted that the four drive server is better. Um, I don't have direct information from Google, but I've heard they've changed their mind. Um, in Azure, I can't tell you what we do. <laughs> um, but I do like the one on the, the, the 90 drive server better. Um, so the reason that the four drive server could be cheaper is if I was buying millions and millions of servers and I didn't have anything to store on them, I could use it as attach points for my software system and my storage system. Um, and there are some very, very senior smart people who fully believe in that four disk server design. Uh, the question is, how big do you get and can you create enough ports to attach it? And can you have the software and manage the complexity because you're tying what you buy together, your storage and your compute? Um, so I'm a big fan of this. This is why I think uh, a lot of people in data centers make mistakes. And if you don't sell what you buy, you're living in dangerous waters because if you keep iterating on your generations of your servers, Moore's Law keeps giving you a pat on the back and saying, hey, I did 20% better this year. I'm doing great. And it's kind of like inflation. If you don't have a level set to know how you're doing against what is possible, you can convince yourself that you're doing good enough. Um, but if you're running a service, and Azure was Microsoft's first experience of running a service and selling it slash renting it, um, you get to be very aware of your costs. In fact, a lot of the costs and tracking systems that you have if you're running, say, just a web service and selling ads uh, might not even exist when you go to become a service. So I don't necessarily believe anybody who's sitting in a data center that isn't renting it out that they understand their costs, because I have pretty strong evidence that they don't. So OK, down to what we wanted to talk about. Uh, what would we need to store a zettabyte? Or why would you need to store a zettabyte? OK, in 2020, there will be 5 billion smartphones. So I, I will tell you that it should be pretty obvious that most of the data stored in the cloud uh, comes from smartphones and smart devices. And most of it is photos. So in 2020, those 5 billion smartphones, if everybody takes two pictures per day, I did a, a very uh, analytical study. I went into my picture folder and figured out how many pictures per day I take. And I use that to represent the entire world. One data point is good enough. So if everybody was like me, it would take uh, 7.3 exabytes per year to store all the photos. Well, I'm not going to need a zettabyte for my photos. OK, what about Internet of Things or Internet of Everything? Seems to be a lot of sensors uh, floating around, maybe some video cameras. Um, I've read some material that says that these are generating huge amounts of data, which obviously isn't going anywhere. We'll find out later. How about this? Oh, video cameras. So on vacation, I noticed that. Uh, People aren't using their phones to take pictures. They're all capturing their experiences with these. Uh, and if everybody gets one of these, we'll have no trouble hitting a zettabyte. Uh, sorry, a little PowerPoint problem. My first time trying to use an animated PowerPoint slide. Um, so all those video sources, and not just these cameras, but all the you know, security cameras and all those new video sources coming out and being distributed and becoming very cheap can generate quite a bit of data. The question is, how long do you want to keep it? And what resolution do you want to keep it? And you know, if you're providing a service, can I actually store it for you and have it be economical? Or does all of this data have to go to DevNull? And the analysts say, Well, that's actually from Intel. Intel says that by 2020, the world will generate 25 zettabytes. But on the internet, I found some people saying that the internet of things generates 400 zettabytes per year now. I have no idea uh, where that number comes from. But I'm sure they did some very uh, rigorous math. Um, so Kastash has just mentioned this. 
the profile of uh, consumer data. I do have very high quality charts, which are confidential, so I couldn't share them. Um, but I can tell you that basically the longer data is stored, the colder it becomes. Um, the expectations, though, for people on retrieval of that data is that it should come back quickly. And figuring out how to tier it um, is critical, and we've heard that multiple times, um, to making it cost effective. And there should be a way to get your original back, even if it takes some time. Um, so at Microsoft, and uh, we've been working with Microsoft Research, and to put this slide to the extreme, um, we said, OK, 90 drives might be nice. What about this? So this is something called Pelican. And it is our answer to cold storage, which is way better than Facebook's cold storage. <laughs> um, so similar to Facebook's system, only certain disks are spun, but they're spun up in groups. They're not spun up on a schedule, although technically they are. Um, disks are in columns, um, and only disks in a column, one disk in a column or two are powered at a time. Uh, this allows the entire rack to be cooled by one fan. Uh, the entire uh, rack is current design drives 3.5 kilowatts for 1,152 disks. Um, I don't know how much experience you guys have with data center, but that's pretty darn good. So this is kind of our take on storing uh, similar to the cold store. Now, in Facebook's favor, they actually have it shipping and running in production. And you know we have some prototypes, but this is not in production yet. There are lots of papers on this system published and videos, so if you want to learn more about it, you can. That's all we're going to talk about Pelican, because it's too complicated. Um, so here's a problem with the zettabytes. So HGST, um, who I get to spend hours and hours a year with, uh, let me uh, give this chart to you guys. This is all the hard disks produced in the entire world every year. And we can see that. Uh, the projected total production of space is 659 exabytes in calendar year 16. It's going to be hard to store a zettabyte on that. Um, and if you take the trajectory of the drive growth, um, it only gets up to about 400 by 2020. But of course, demand can change everything. So if we create the demand, uh, they'll build the drives for us, I'm pretty sure. Um, so this is how I predict the future. Um, we talked about the 1990s. So in 1991, this was my computer, uh, my development machine. It had four megabytes of RAM, a 33 megahertz CPU, a 60 megabyte hard drive. It wasn't as expensive as, as Kastashis here. Uh, and you know a 10 megabit NIC. In 2008, when I started to work on Azure, um, that's the improvement that we saw. And the annual improvement is also sometimes referred to as the CAGR compound annual growth rate of that technology. It's kind of uh, putting a meter on Moore's law for a set of technology. And you can see that disks were kicking ass back in the 90s. Um, if you come forward to since I started on Azure to now, you'll see that disks are having more problems. Um, the rate of improvement is dropping off. We'll talk more about that later. Um, CPUs are definitely dropping off. And RAM is dropping off uh, quite a bit, too. So these are things that scare us. NICs have improved quite a bit. Um, they've had uh, a kind of a revolution in technology. Uh, when I started working in the data center, the networks were one gigabits. And I said, I can't store data on that if I want to do big storage. And I had to fight to get them to bump it to 10. And now everybody's on board. We're going to 40 and more. Um, all right, now we're going to talk about each media type. So hard disks, as Kasash has mentioned, are hitting the limits of PMR. Um, these are the sizes of hard drives that uh, have been and will be available, we think. Um, and that does not look like an exponential or a very good exponential curve. And those are the growth rates. Uh, as we mentioned, SMR is a one-time bump. SMR is the idea that, um, well, hard drives aren't necessarily what you think they are. Um, I've got a good story. So I, I sat down uh, with Seagate early on, and I told them that uh, uh, we have, we're having a hard, high failure rates with their hard drives. And they said, oh, well, what's your duty cycle? And I said, 100%. And the VP of storage was sitting right there, and she turned white as a ghost. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Anyway, I since learned that hard drives uh, have something called, well, they basically have uh, 
when you record in one place, um, that recording will affect all the adjacent tracks, adjacent track interference. And as they pack the tracks tighter and tighter together, they get more and more, and the drives have to spend more and more time just keeping your data alive on them. Uh, so the trick with uh, SMR is rather than writing randomly across the disk, they write in bands. And by writing in bands, they, you know, they say, oh, they're overlapping, they're shingled, but they're really reducing the adjacent track interference so that they can write uh, more easily and get a little more space. But past SMR and adding platters, um, they don't really have an answer today, except for Hammer. There are videos on the internet that you can see of a Seagate Hammer drive prototype running. There are still a lot of challenges to getting it to work. If Hammer comes, the potential is for a 10x bump in hard drive density, given the same number of platters. But there's a laser on board, so maybe they can't pack as many platters. But uh, anyways, Moore's Law is probably good. So from the calculations for what it would take to store a zettabyte, I don't know if we're going to have Hammer in time or whether or not it will hit the mainstream drives that we use, but I'm estimating that they can get 50% uh, improvement in cost. Um, and this is not a roadmap slide. This is something that I predicted based on known data back in uh, 2014. Uh, and it, you know, some things are accurate and some things are wrong, and I can't tell you which. Uh, SSDs, so SSDs uh, just went through a miracle. Um, they were on one Y nanometer, they're getting down to 14 nanometers, and they were storing a bit with seven electrons. Um, I wouldn't like all my data stored in just seven electrons, but uh, they're still hideously expensive because of the cost of the fabs to pr produce them, but the general consensus is that they still have a 30% CAGR. The miracle was going 3D, so by stacking them up, they were able to go to bigger cells, which gives them better endurance. Um, so when you start getting down to a 14 nanometer cell and you start to try and store three bits in it, which is what they do for consumer flash, they get down to maybe 100 cycles that they can program it before it's crap. It doesn't work. Um, by going 3D, they go back to many more cycles. Um, and then when they've gone 3D, and now they can shrink again. So they'll get back to the lower cycles, but their costs will go down. It's quite safe to assume that they'll do 30% for the foreseeable future in terms of their annual improvement. Optical, okay. So I have a lot of trouble with optical. Kastashis tells me it's the future. Um, and Kastashis is pretty smart, so he might be right. Uh, when I first looked at the 100 gigabyte, I said, what is this thing? It doesn't save me any money. I can only write it once. What the hell are you guys doing? Because as soon as you guys announced, sorry, as soon as Facebook announced that uh, they were doing optical, a whole bunch of VPs are emailing me, why aren't we doing optical? <laughs> and uh, yeah, not fun. Um, so then I have to go and do math and cost models and explain to them that even though Facebook is saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, it actually isn't. Now when you get to 300 gigabyte disks, it gets more interesting. Um, but there is something better. When you get to one terabyte disks, it could get much more interesting if you can get there. Now, remember what this claim is. So the hard drive guys who have a sealed environment are putting helium into their drives. They have a media that they have complete control over, and they have a head that is super advanced in terms of it uses heat to cause the bending. And the optical guys have a laser sitting at the end of a control arm that moves back and forth, and they're going to achieve better density than the hard drive guys is the claim. OK, maybe. Um, the other thing is that all this optical technology is based on DVD technology, and they have to make this leap from being a consumer technology to being a data center technology. And take the, making that leap takes money in order to continue to reinvest and invest and create all this new technology. So now let's talk about tape. So tape is shipping 10 terabyte tapes, and they've demonstrated 220 terabyte. Well, what the heck? How can a tape be so much better so here's my demo. So this is a 10 terabyte tape. And if this was full with uh, Kistashis's, uh optical disks, this would have the same capacity. But we know that we can have a 220 terabyte tape. So that would be uh, 22 of these packs by comparison. This requires new technology. To get this to 220 requires no new technology. Well, why the heck is that? Um, and the answer is surface area. So there are 
There is, sorry, between one of these disks and this, there is 1,200 times the surface area. This is a one kilometer long tape. They don't have, you know, they're sandbagging. They don't have to try in order to hit these densities. The optical guys are creating new physics, new lasers, new technology, new head control. Uh, so here's just uh, the roadmap that uh, IBM has. Uh, Oracle has a similar roadmap. And like I say, these guys are just sandbagging. They can go wherever they want as long as the demand is there. But they really don't have people asking them for these tapes yet, except for me. Uh, this is uh, the LTO roadmap. Um, and this is a kind of a feed down from the enterprise tape roadmap from IBM. IBM is the root of all tape. This is the disk roadmap. Do I have to go back? OK, look at that. Look at that. Which would you bet on? <laughs> OK, so now let's get into how we model these different costs. Um, data center space and power. Uh, I tried to look out for literature because I can't use my own. Different people claim between 6 and $12 million per megawatt to build a data center. Very big data centers are about 90 megawatts. Um, when you build a system, like you've got a server for hard drives, you've got a server, RAID controllers, uh, you've got network overhead. Um, for hot storage, uh, the media slot tax, which is the cost of everything but the media, can be as high as 50% and as low as 24% for cold storage. For uh, Pelican, uh, the slot tax is negligible. Uh, network infrastructure cost, uh, time to fill is actually not factored into this model. Uh, media life is factored into this model, but I operate under the presumption that no matter what your media is, by the time the technology comes out seven years later, you've moved off that media. So your media life is limited to seven years uh, for optical and for tape. Uh, this is just talking about tape and optical. Um, there are some other advantages to tape libraries. So as I said, they're sandbagging on the media. So they're creating new tape drives every few years and they don't actually throw out the media. They can create a new tape drive that stores more bits on old media, so you can upgrade your library. I can deploy my 10 terabyte uh, tapes today, and in two or three years, I can get a new drive, and I can upgrade that to maybe uh, more. Um, tape libraries have tighter environmental constraints. Um, you can't put a tape library in a swamp and have it work. Um, Today, tape libraries require fiber channel infrastructure. I would assert that both those problems can be solved. And obviously, um, I'm trying to work to solve them. OK, so now we're going to go through. Today and five years from now, um, using retail pricing, because wholesale pricing is confidential, I'll say how much data center space, how much power, and how much it will cost to store. Um, so for the SSD storage, I assume a high performance server. I assume if you're storing on SSD, you actually want to access it pretty fast. So you probably need it in three replica. With enough CPU and smarts, you could probably get it down to 1.3 replicas with erasure coding. So if, if you believe that, you can cut these numbers in half. In the future design, I assume 128 terabytes per server. And that with a 30% CAGR, we get down to 10 cents per gigabyte retail. This is what you wind up with. A zettabyte would cost a trillion dollars uh, on flash. Um, but that's, uh, sorry, that's per year. Three trillion to build it. And we take three million racks and 46 gigawatts. But the good news is in 2020, it'll only cost you 238 billion a year. <laughs> um, another problem is that actually that much flash is not produced every year. OK, so let's go to hard disk storage. So I'm assuming um, not too aggressive design. I mean, it's not Pelican. Um, 90 disks per server, 8 terabyte disks today. I'm assuming 24 terabyte disks uh, in 2020. But if Hammer comes, they could be better. I assume they'll be slightly more expensive, though, because of the lasers. Uh, and they'll consume a little more power. This is what you get. To buy a zettabyte today will cost you $125 billion, or $41 billion per year. It will take you 200,000 racks and 1.2 gigawatts. 
Um, so remember I said that a big data center is about 90 megawatts. So that's about 140 big data centers. Uh, gets better in 2020. Uh, and this is actually kind of interesting. So in 2020, it's 17 billion a year. Is that ridiculous? I guess it depends on how much you charge for it. But the other thing to realize is that storage is a big business. If all this data is going online and people are really going to have those videos and, and they're storing it, there's a lot of money involved. And even if it's a pretty low margin business, which it probably will be, um, it's big enough to be interesting. Uh, now we'll go to optical. So these are my assumptions. I don't have as much data on uh, the DVD storage, uh, archive storage, so I'm just using the same patterns and making some assumptions about, I'm assuming the one terabyte media does show up at 150K per rack, which is probably optimistic. Uh, but this is what I get. So on the 300 gigabytes, it would cost you 192 billion to store a zettabyte. It's getting more economical even today. Um, and with the one uh, terabyte drives, you'd be at uh, 29 billion, 4 billion per year. Um, there is another uh, problem with optical is the rewrite rate. So how often do people delete their data? Because every time they delete their data, if they do it in three and a half years, the cost doubles because I can't erase it. Uh, on tape, that's not true. You can erase it. You can do hundreds of passes. Uh, Zettabytes on tape. So in 2020, we expect, I expect, using a 30% CAGR to have 40 terabyte tapes. Uh, I expect the tape drives to be on Ethernet, so they don't need fiber channel gateways, um, which they do today, which in the present power number I include. Um, so I include a couple of racks to take 20 kilowatts in order to talk to a tape library. And you can see that you can uh, store a zettabyte for 1.9 billion in uh, 2020. Uh, that is cheap. That is dirt, dirt cheap. And what it means is you probably have to store it on tape. Because if you have a P&L and you have accountants and you have competition, someone will store their data there. Certainly the oldest and coldest will wind up there. Now the question then becomes, what data goes where? Uh, so this is just a, a graph for 2015 today. Uh, you can see the comparison between flash, hard disk, optical, and tape. If you're comparing to Flash, everything looks cheap. Uh, but you can see optical is a little cheaper than hard drive today. Tape is much cheaper. Um, optical and tape get closer in the future if they can get to the one ter terabyte tape. But there, there, there's another point, uh, which is the sandbagging on tape. They have much more area. And if this is a penny, a gigabyte, that would be a $100 tape. How much do you think actually goes into this thing? Some plastic, some media. Um, I used to buy a VHS tape for five bucks. So there's probably a significant margin in here. So then the question is, in volume, what can this be compared to the other media? And I would assert that tape has the biggest levers to pull to even reduce costs further if they have the incentive to do so. So this is the summary. Um, we can store a zettabyte in 2020, and therefore we will. Um, the question is, knowing that now, how does that change your outlook on the future? Because that is actually the most important thing. Uh, in terms of research, optimizing the storage tiers is uh, critical. I mean, we saw the billions and billions and billions of dollars you can save um, by optimizing those tiers. Uh, there isn't enough media to store this today. Um, so they're going to have to ramp up. Uh, you're going to need a cold archive tier because you can't spend five to ten times as much to store data that nobody accesses. And that's all I had. Any questions? So if we take the stream uh, tape example to the extreme, you end up with just a giant spool of tape in one rack, right? 
A giant spool of tape in one rack? One single tape per rack, really. That huge. I, I'm sorry. I, I... So the biggest, uh, the, out of this package, right, a lot comes from the mechanics. St you still have a package. You have still pl a plastic, right? You have, you have a package of plastic. Oh, you're asking me what's inside here? No, 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 no. What? But I'm saying that if you just try to build a tape which is way bigger. You should try and build a tape that's way bigger. Okay, so uh, maybe, so one of the advantages of tape is that uh, because it's a, a common form factor, when they produce a new drive, they can add more capacity to it. Uh, the tape is already a kilometer long. So making it bigger, it makes it harder to handle uh, bigger media footprint to be damaged. And it doesn't really need to be bigger. I mean, if this costs, if it costs me $10 to build this cartridge, and it costs me $15 to build a bigger cartridge, how much advantage am I getting, considering that I, I'm not really taking advantage of the media entirely? So the tape ecosystem takes uh, advances from the drive ecosystem from years ago, and then it applies them to the tape media. Now, they have their own little challenges around handling the media. Uh, you know, they, they touch the tape when they write it. Uh, and they have a whole bunch of other technologies like read after write. They have 3D, sorry, 2, 2D error correction, 3D error correction. I don't know what, how you call it. But when you're writing uh, on a disk, you can only write in, write in one dimension. So all your error correction codes have to go in that dimension as well. When you're writing on tape, you can write all over the surface. So if you like, the parity and error correction codes are in two dimensions and you can scratch the media and not lose your data. I guess probably along the same lines. Uh, I'm curious about what uh, what the trade-off between large tapes and disk would be in terms of you know, how long does it take me to get to the, my the workload? The trade-off between large tapes and large... Well, tapes. sure. So tapes tapes have always been, or a lot of times tapes have been dense, but they also have very long access times. They're less random access than disks, even though disks aren't completely random access. And so I guess my real question is, if you're using cold storage, you've got this retrieval planning problem, right? And that and the retrieval time is some function of the characteristics of... Uh, your storage media. And so I guess my, I don't have a feel for what the impact would be uh, in terms of that retrieval time, mm -hmm. average retrieval time, say, for you know these big disk arrays versus arrays of tape or whatever form they take. Right, I, I mean, the data accesses on tape are definitely colder, um, especially for small objects. Uh, so there are some strategies to, to deal with that. And sometimes you have to go up to the application. So we're building archival storage, and we've been talking to some customers. And uh, one good example is the movie industry. So the movie industry needs to store everything at very high resolution, but they don't need to retrieve it very often. And what they'll do is they'll store a lower resolution copy on something hotter. So they can even edit the film on a low resolution copy. They kind of figure out which parts they need and they go and have the system go and retrieve them and pull them together. Um, and you know, I kind of said in my last slide that figuring out the strategies for which tiers you put which data in, moving between them um, is an area that we need to invest in. Um, and it, you know, it can be per application. Um, in Azure, we have more difficulty in that we're trying to provide a generic service. It's hard to hide the tiering in a generic service. In Facebook, you know your application. so it would be much easier for them to define how they're going to tier. And we see from the cold storage that Kastash has pointed out, they know what that data is. They also know that it's probably never going to get a race. So they can make easier decisions on how they're going to tier it. Right? They have the application to the media end to end. 